Hello, and welcome back to Movie Remake Time, the Filmmaker's Compass podcast, where we take a look at reboots, remakes, and sequels, and ask the very simple question, who did it better? I'm CP. This is my amazing co-host, D-Man. We need to start out by saying, Happy New Year's, everyone. This is going to be the first Filmmaker's Compass podcast episode of 2022. So we are hoping that you're off to a great year and are excited about all the great things in the world of cinema to come. Well, and one of the things that stands out is we just had a new sequel released within the last, you know, week and a half, which is Matrix Resurrections. So it's the fourth Matrix film in the franchise, and that includes other video games and the Animatrix and all these you know, different components of the Matrix universe. But I believe it goes The Matrix, Reloaded, Revolutions, and now Resurrections. Correct. So we felt it 100% appropriate to add that to our list for movie remake time. And we decided after watching the new one and kind of taking a look back at the original trilogy that the new one is probably best to compare to the original. So that's what we're going to be discussing on the show today is how does the new Matrix Resurrections hold up against the original Matrix? So I'm going to throw it over to you real quick. What are your first opinions kind of of this movie? Did you enjoy it? Well, so just audience, take a step back here. Remember, the original Matrix movie came out in 1999. So it has been quite some time uh, until 2021, you know, more than 20 years where we're finally getting to this fourth installment of the film. And preparing for this episode, D-Man, I thought it was really cool to go back and kind of watch that film again critically. Um, And it's amazing at how well parts of the first Matrix movie still hold up. Oh, it's a fantastic movie. I mean, it gets the praise it deserves. I mean, I think when you look at the impact the original Matrix had on things like sci-fi, special effects... Uh, Even, you know, it's very notable for its use of the hero's journey and how audiences still respond to that same kind of, uh, you know, story we've seen a thousand times. What is it? A hero with a thousand faces? Yep. You know, the famous book about. Yeah. Hero's journey. So, I mean, you know, it's, it's one of those movies. It also, you know, it's famous. It's probably, you know, its biggest claim to fame is that it, got people to think, (laughs) you know, uh, got everybody asking philosophical questions and wondering like, Hey, are we, are we in a matrix right now? Yeah. Right. (laughs) Where are we? And would we, you know, would we even know if we were probably not. And so the movie itself, I think the original, if you look at how much time has passed between that and, you know, resurrections now, it's amazing how well, the original Matrix holds up. Uh, I would still say, I mean, it's we're at the top of the episode, but it's the best of the entire franchise. Still, oh. right at the beginning. Yeah, I totally agree. So you can so, turn on, you, you don't need to keep listening to us ramble on anymore. You got your answer right there, folks. Yeah, I mean, it, I, I don't even think, you know, I, I would be, I, I would think it would be hard to find anybody who would honestly say that Matrix Resurrections is better than the original. But what's interesting is how meta Resurrections is in relation to the original Matrix. What they're doing story-wise within, right? Like they're having the character of Neo having forgotten who he is, right? And we don't know exactly why he's there, why he's in a Matrix, but using his memories, apparently he created a video game called The Matrix, And it's based on the previous movie's plots and basically his storyline. And, you know, there's kind of this self-awareness within the film about the impact of the original. They're constantly thinking out loud for next video game chapters about what's our next bullet time. And, (laughs) yeah, you know, there's a certain, you know, there's a certain callback in this movie, which is, you know, really unique, especially in big blockbuster filmmaking, I think. Well, and on top of that, I take it even a step further, which which is I think that the filmmakers share our opinions of the Matrix trilogy and went so forth as even a straight up tell the audience. They're like, hey, you know, there's there's a whole conversation 
under the guise of the video game development company where they are talking about their parent company, Warner Brothers, and, and how Warner Brothers is going to, whether they're going to make a new Matrix game, whether it's the original team or someone else. So they're going to do this because this is the best thing for the franchise, which is the filmmakers talking to us and saying, hey, this was going to happen. We just figured we'd go along for the ride and make the most out of this and get paid in the process. Um, so as you said, it was a very meta film. And there's actual literal snippets of actually, I think all three of the original trilogy, but mostly the first movie that pop up throughout kind of either as these kind of like memory flashes, or maybe it's uh, just the movie kind of acknowledging a couple things that happened, you know, it has been, what do we say, 23 years. So, you know, a little yeah. refresher. They threw that in there. You no, know, my first, Im- my first impressions of the new movie were, you know, obviously I don't think it's going to have anywhere near the same impact as the original, but it was kind of a fun movie for fans. It was kind of hang, you know, fun to hang out with Neo again. Uh, you know, get some of the old cast back together, or at least some of the old characters back together something that was unique about this film was that they they didn't bring back Lawrence Fishburne as Morpheus they recast him in a entirely new Morpheus role uh, yeah. which actually now having seen the film uh, I understand why that is now I don't yeah. know if that had anything to do with Lawrence Lawrence Fishburne's reluctance to actually come back or not who knows mm-hmm. but they also did something similar with Mr. Smith the character is still uh, kind of a you know, lingering villain on the edges and Mm -hmm. he pops up throughout the film in different, you know, kind of big moments, but it's a different act. Um, Yeah. Yeah. You know, so they're, they're, you know, having a little fun with that, but the number one thing I kind of took away from the new one, and this is what really stood out to me is that I'm not a hundred percent sure why it was made. And (laughs) I think that's a problem. Well, so I don't I don't think the themes like I'm not 100 percent percent sure, like what exactly were you going for? And when you kind of take a look back at the story and it's, you know, kind of there's this theme of maybe like rebirth or, you know, people regaining consciousness, right, connecting with their previous selves. There's certain themes at play, but I'm not 100 percent sure, like exactly why, like what? You know, there's this connection between like Neo and Trinity, and then you have, you know, Barney Stinson in there somewhere trying to, <laughs> <laughs> you know, Patrick Harris, who's like, I just needed to reboot the Matrix. You're like, I guess, I don't know. Like, why though? Well, I can tell you why. Um, and the fact is, Warner Brothers thought they could make a lot of money by bringing back the Matrix movie. So that was the reason why. Now, whether from a story standpoint that's justified, uh, I don't think that it is. And I think we saw that play out in this version of the film where um, whether you like it or not, the first Matrix was kind of a completed arc. Um, and I think a lot of fans were disappointed by the time we got to the end of the initial uh, re- by the time we got to the end of the original Matrix trilogy, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I think the biggest hang up with most people was the fact that um, essentially it kind of just ends with peace with the machines and everyone's going back in the Matrix, who's in the Matrix, and everyone who's not in the Matrix gets to live in peace and, and that's it. And I think a lot of fans felt that that was kind of not what we were expecting when in this first film, we set it up that Neo is the one who is going to lead this revolution and they are going to free the human Duracells from their captors. And what I think is really weird is, as you said, from a, a story standpoint, this film does not kind of go back and try and retread that ground and say, okay, what does it look like when we said, you know, we made peace with the machines, but now at this point in time, we need more than peace. We need to free all these people who are still slaves. And that didn't happen. And that's why I think you're right. It's really weird. And I don't know. Now I'm just rambling. I don't know oh. why it was made <laughs> other than money. I, and I think too, you know, when comparing it to the original Matrix, the original Matrix, the themes are so obvious, right? You have humans versus machines. You have 
uh, you know, this kind of uh, believing in yourself and, fi- you know, if, if, no, if you don't believe, right, if Neo doesn't believe he's the one, then he's not, right? Yeah. Because the only convers- way to truly, yeah, the only way to truly ever realize your potential is to believe in yourself. And we see it play out and it plays out in epic fashion. I mean, it was amazing. But yeah, it's like the new one just doesn't really know, I think, what it's trying to be. And for that reason, you know, it doesn't get the benefit being so distant from the original trilogy, even, you know, revolutions to resurrections. We're looking at, you know, over a decade. Mm-hmm. And because of that, it, it, it's like you, you really need to have a strong reason to bring something back again. Right. And I think uh, like a great example, uh, you know, here, here's my star Wars moment in this. Here it is. Uh, You know, you look at something like the original star Wars trilogy universally regarded. Almost everybody is like, Hey, star Wars deserves its spot atop that pedestal, but they've come out with two different trilogies, a prequel and a sequel trilogy to that original. And the thing that, you know, neither was perfect. Uh, And if you look at the prequel trilogy, they all have their flaws, right? And a lot of them can actually be attributed to George Lucas. But the one thing you can't take away from the prequel trilogy is George Lucas didn't make those for money. He had a story he was trying to tell. Now, whether he was great at doing that is questionable. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, obviously, I think the prequel trilogy ended up being pretty great in that the, you know, stuff that's inspired the Clone Wars, some of the characters that came out of it. We're actually, you know, it's really impressive. But then you go and you look at the Star Wars sequel trilogy, and we got to the end of that in like 2019. And now you you take a look at it, and you're kind of like, why did you make these? Like Disney. I mean, did you just make them because you paid four billion dollars for the right to make them, or did you actually have a story? Was there a reason? And I think mm-hmm. that's the problem, is you know, you end up in this this state where it's like. I don't know a hundred percent why it was made and that's well, troublesome. I think, I think piggybacking off what you just said, we talk about on this show a lot about how good reboots, remakes, sequels are bringing something new to a conversation. And I yeah. think there is no story that is more relevant to taking a new fresh perspective on than the matrix, Right where we've come in terms of AI, where we've come in terms of the internet, where we've come in terms of computer science. I mean, the original Matrix came out before social networking. Yeah, and it's crazy. 1999. And now we have this world where we, you know, technology has evolved so rapidly since that movie. And on top of it, we've been living in these information silos anyway, you know, from a greater macro perspective as we're looking at you know, uh, echo chambers that people are in and information and, and what a great time to look at what's going on in the world now from the perspective of this story and this franchise. And I think it was a huge opportunity that was missed. Yeah. Instead, it just really tends to kind of, uh, retread the classic beats from the original, you know, whether it's, And they sit down in the chairs and plug in like there's just, you know, a new dozer, a new Orpheus, you know. Yeah. The only plot element that really stood out as anything, you know, truly unique was, you know, at least in the new Zion, I think IO, um, they were trying to grow fruit, which was at least interesting to me. Like, I don't know if you can or not, because the, you know, sun is blacked out and maybe, you know, they're just it's a lost cause. You can grow a couple, but you'll never do it on a mass scale. But I mean, it's, I don't know. It's just one of those things where I was like, at least they're trying something new here. Cause for, yeah, most of the film, I mean, really you're like, I mean, it's just retreading a lot of these moments. Like he gets called into his boss's office, Mr. Anderson, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like he jumps off a roof again. He does, you know, like all these things where you're like, I don't know. And I do, you know, I think, especially when it comes to special effects, there was something, the spectacle of what the Matrix was able to achieve in terms of really wowing people, 
you know, mm. even the first time, like in at the end of the original one, like when Neo holds up his hand and he can stop bullets. Yeah. You yeah. know, everyone in the audience was like, whoa, yeah. you know, not because the effects were so good and we're like, wow, look at they were able to show us that bullets can stop midair. It was just the power that he was able to convey by doing that. And it worked so well. And in this one, you know, he's kind of like riding around on a motorcycle and people are firing guns and he's like, oh, block bullets. And you're like, yeah, <laughs> like, I mean, I, right. Like if you can block bullets, I mean, what can't you do? And I think that was always a problem with the sequels in the matrix was that they kind of maxed out Neo in one. And mm, that's a good point. Everybody, everybody was always like, ah, you know, at least, you know, you go back to something like star Wars where it's like, I mean, Luke used the force to destroy the death star, but he can't really use a lightsaber yet. And, you know, <laughs> yeah, 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 doesn't really know a lot about the force. So there's a lot of learning left to do. And I don't know, it just loses some of that spectacle. Obviously, you know, bullet time in its day, even the behind the scenes, which still fascinates me. Remember how they set those uh, cameras up on like an elliptical? Yeah. And yeah. they literally like captured all the frames and they just, like, if you watch it, it's like the cameras just go like, like all the way around, but they're actually all clicking simultaneously and they're <laughs> able to move in and out of any space on that elliptical. Is, is, pretty cool. is that the uh, technical term for it, Dustin? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, <laughs> that's how it sounded to me. But yeah, it's like, even that, you know, it was groundbreaking in the thought process, although, you know, special effects have moved beyond that, you know, into like total 100% digital realms, but are digital environments. Well, no, and I mean, I'd, I'd go. I mean, I think, uh, you know, another issue that I had is, the first Matrix movie, like the combat sequences were so revolutionary, right? The Wachowskis were looking at what they saw coming out of Hong Kong cinema, cinema and brought that over to American audiences, you know? And again, in this one, I was just like, I mean, yeah, there's fight sequences, but nothing to what I would expect worthy of a new attempt at the Matrix, you know? Yeah. Even something like, uh, you know, I don't know that the Matrix invented this, but it definitely brought it mainstream was that concept of like these guys would be thrown into walls and like the walls would would like collapse or like, yeah, there was like, like slow this motion. Real, yeah. Yeah. There was this like real weight where like these people could punch through cinder blocks and right there. It really made that element of fighting mainstream where it was like, oh, dude, like every hit feels so intense. And they do that here, but it, again, it just feels a little bit more like a retread than it yeah. does uh, really, you know, kind of pushing boundaries in any major way. Yeah. So no, that's true. That's a good point. I don't know. They, they were just, I mean, there were so many things like one of my favorite sequences in, in any of the matrix films is where Morpheus explains what the matrix is when he's like in that chair and he's like, welcome to the real. Yeah. You know, uh, and he kind of talks about and it all ends with him like so the whole point of all of this is to turn a human being into this and it's a Duracell yep. battery and yeah. you're like whoa that like I just went for a trip that was wild yeah like you th and then you know that stuff gets you thinking like would machines ever do that and you're like I think they would I mean the movie The Matrix is out there and there's nothing to say that artificial intelligence wouldn't enjoy movies so <laughs> Why not? You know, we're giving them all the ideas. <laughs> Good but, point. Well, yeah, well, I mean, no, continue. So, yeah, I think, you know, looking, looking back at the original, um, you know, something else that always stood out to me was the score, mm. Mm -hmm. which was really important because it's, it's incredibly powerful. It has that kind of like neo-noir feel. Uh, but it's also like iconic, you know, that, that real heavy, those real heavy notes coming in and even the way they, they do most things in the movie, there's like, you know, some cool, like, you know, just little like punk music. I think Neil's like walking in the matrix and they have that rock song at the end. It was, I don't know, even this movie at the end, it like hits the rock music at the end. I was like, Oh my God, you guys are like redoing it. <laughs> You know, I don't know. So let's talk about some of the 
some of the characters, right? Obviously, Mm -hmm. we get Neo, we get Trinity back in this movie. Um, We have the character Morpheus. He's different. And I I don't want to go into the details of, of why he's different. But my question is, do you think it held the same weight that his character did in the original trilogy. Obviously he's in a very different role. He's a different type of character. Um, do you think that's as effective? I mean, they were trying no. to do something different and they did it. I don't think so. And this is something that I often feel personally in terms of storytelling, but when you have characters lose their memories, uh, a lot of the times I also think they lose some of their agency. They, they, mm. They're not, you know, if, I, I guess what I'm saying is like, you know, based on everything we know about the previous films, if you just have the character lose his memory, then it's like everything that had happened doesn't really count as like a lesson learned. True. You know? And so it really just kind of like resets characters. You know, Trinity doesn't even realize she's Trinity till like literally the end of the third act. Yeah, it's... At which point you're like, is that really Trinity? Like, who are we if we don't have our memories? You know, good point. Good point. It's the reason why when you know identical twins are born, they're not the same fucking people. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's you. The characters lose some of what we had come to love about them, and because I think the movie goes to great lengths to not have them remember till later. Um, it, it doesn't to me feel like, you know, a lot of the things that happened before really matter. Yeah. That's a good point. You know, I mean, Neil remembers things. He's like, Oh, this person or that person kind of like, you know, a person who was asleep for a long time, but I don't know. It's just, there's something about that element. I don't like that. You know, I think it was, you know, you look back to me, it's like one of those, like, cheap filmmaking tricks to just you know kind of reset the deck yeah no that makes sense i think it was like spider-man 3 like harry gets hit in the head and he has amnesia so like he forgets all this stuff for a majority of the film and then you're like i mean that was really just a cheap plot device so we don't have to deal with him for a while yeah you know Mm -hmm. and so to me it's like it feels like you know hey let's have them let, you know we'll come up with a good reason why we rebooted them but essentially like you know a lot of the things that happened before we don't have to pay that much attention to it because no one remembers <laughs> i think that's a good point um, i don't know i mean what do you, what do you think it i mean again you brought the characters back as you said we get such a small amount of the trinity character it's almost a wasted opportunity um we spend a lot of time with Neo, which we should. I mean, he is he is the main character. Um, but again, I feel like they try to put his character through too much story arc in one film. You could have had a new Matrix trilogy where we have Neo at the end of the first movie remembering who he is and rediscovering and, and setting himself free again. Um you know, going through the process of, of discovering the outside world then and, and, you know, freeing Trinity and then the final act where they, they take on the matrix and they kind of try and cram all those into one movie. And it just seems way too much for a character who started off with such a reset, as you said, Um, I did not like the look at Morpheus because in the original, he is, you know, in the original trilogy, the weight that he brings, right. He is the believer in Neo. And he, his strength as a character is the fact that he has this very focused worldview, right? And he's a visionary and he sees what's to come and he has this goal for where he's going to take these characters. And the new one doesn't bring any of that weight. He's not the sage. He's not the guide that Neo needed. Yeah, he's more like an AI companion. And, you know, he's more, he tries, he's like a little goofier and it's, it was such a break of the the character that I think we all love from the first one, who's kind of this, this strong, um, focus driven individual that I, I just, I didn't like it. I was like, "Mm, it's different, cool, but it's not the character that I love from the original films. 
Yeah, I still think, you know, the biggest draw of the Matrix and what the movies themselves need to do is, is find something philosophical that gets people thinking. And that element of what the Matrix is separates it from every other action movie out there. Good right? point. And separates it from a lot of sci-fi movies. You know, you think Terminator, right? Is the, I love Terminator. But in terms of sci-fi, it's basically like machines win the future and we sent someone back to save the present. Yeah. You know, and it doesn't, the Terminator's movies don't really dwell too much on the philosophical aspect, you know, it's like the Terminator's here to kill Sarah Connor, kill John Connor. And that's the story. Yeah. Where the matrix actually deals with this concept, right? The idea of a matrix can be applied even in our own lives in a lot of ways. Like a lot of us live in matrices Mm -hmm. that, you know, are either constructed around us or that we're ignorant to. And when you think about the giant philosophical idea of freeing your mind, it's like they don't, they're not dealing with any of that here. They're just kind of playing in the sandbox of the old world. Well, I, I, and you're absolutely right. I mean, I remember um, college classes after, you know, after the matrix where, you know, these themes with technology and free will and right. were discussed readily. And even to the point that I know when the Wachowskis approached Warner Brothers at about making the original film, one of their big hangups was the fact that they're like, hey, are we going to, you know, shell out $60 million for this philosophical, you know, thought piece? Like, that's a big risk. Like, we're not sure if we're willing to do that. Um, And I think you're right. But I think that's one of the things that sets this film apart. I remember when it came out, people telling me that they went to see The Matrix three or four times so they could truly understand it. And there's nothing like that in this one. Yeah. I mean, I remember people talking about, you know, a matrix within a matrix or even the concept of like, they created a video game called enter the matrix. And there was this element of like, you could actually go there. Yeah. Yeah. And it all felt like they were building on top of something that was, you know, uh, really important. And I don't know, I feel like you need to introduce some sort of philosophical, you know, either a binary or at least a debate to really make the movie a necessary viewing experience. Okay. That's you know? a good point. And I think yeah. often that's represented through our villains, right? The matrix was created by the machines. Um, they're the ones who kind of pigeonholed people into this position of not knowing what is real or who they are. Right. Identity is a big theme of the original matrix. Mm-hmm. And you know, a, a great villain is, you know, Thanos in Avengers Infinity War. He talks about, you know, hey, I, you know, I want to capture the stones because, you know, in order for everyone to truly thrive, we need to, you know, wipe some people out. We need to clean the slate a little bit and then everybody else is going to be great. And True. there's a philosophical debate there, you know, yeah, that's interesting enough where you're like, I mean, not to say that anybody would necessarily side with Thanos, but at the same time, you're like, I can at least understand what his motivation is. Yeah. And like here, I just don't get what the villains are even after. Well, and I think that brings me up to another major point. Um, there are characters in this film who work with the heroes that are artificial intelligence. And mm-hmm. I think that is a huge universal shift from the original trilogy where, I mean, yeah, there are a handful of programs in the matrix, but for the most part, the machines are bad. The people are good. Um, And I think that if this was a theme that they wanted to explore, then they really needed to lean into it and they didn't. And I don't really know where they were going there. Yeah. And that's a, that's a trouble. That's a troubling, right? You always want a really, really strong villain. Um, you know, I think Mr. Smith, when he has his little monologue to Morpheus, when he's, you know, handcuffed and he talks about, you know, uh, the only real virus is humanity. Yeah, that's a great one. Uh, Great. He like goes into this whole thing, but it's, 
how he views people, you know, from the other side, he's like, you guys are like a plague, you know, Mm -hmm. you're Mm -hmm. terrible. You ruin everything. You hold on to these concepts of love and this to justify what you do, but it's all trash. It's all terrible. Mm -hmm. You, you know, you guys ruin everything. And he's like, we're better. We're the better version. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And you got to have a villain that has those real strong motivations where we're like, I mean, he's not wrong. Mm -hmm. Right. He isn't wrong, but that doesn't mean that, right. Our motivations are worthless. They're not right. Mm -hmm. When you think about existence, in general like if you're going to exist then try to make it count for something yeah yeah but yeah so here you have neil patrick harris's character and he was yeah but he's kind of just like you know i i brought you guys back to life Uh, for some reason at the end he kind of explains it but he's like apparently if they can get neo and trinity close enough something happens i don't know (laughs) yeah you know what i mean like you're like so i don't know i mean but why why would you do that what was so important that you you essentially brought these characters back to life like why i and that i couldn't get to Mm -hmm. at least not on my single view maybe it's there maybe it's deeper and if somebody out there one of our listeners knows the answer to that question then i'd be interested but, you know, upon my single viewing, I just didn't arrive at, at any conclusion where I was like, man, these these villains are really after something. You know, like, what's he even doing? Like, apparently there's peace. I mean, what's the problem? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. It was it was interesting. And I mean, I mean, audiences, if you've seen the film, you know, I'd love to know your thoughts. But I'm thinking a lot of you probably didn't because based off of the box office performance, this heavily underperformed i think it's as so far at the time of this podcast it's made about half of the budget so that's not you know good by any means um i don't know i mean i i guess i come back to this it's not just from a perspective of you know having something new to say but why are we bringing back the matrix in general when this is a property which has laid dormant for so long, despite, as you said, right, there were video games, there were things where it would have been a totally perfect opportunity to bring, bring forth a Matrix, you know, television series or, or bring forth these movies earlier. I almost wonder if part of the problem is that fans forgot about the Matrix or, you know, they, they, they moved on and they're, they're older in their lives and they're not as readily uh and excited to go out to the movies is, you know, other fan bases. Well, and I think too, you know, the matrix itself, uh, they placed the matrix in a moment in time, which was Mm -hmm. 1999. So that around the nineties is allegedly when the war happened. So roughly, I don't know, whatever, 60 plus years take place, right? between the end of revolutions and resurrection. So within story, time has passed, right? But the, yeah. the issue is that the matrix itself and its place in, in that world is the 90s. And so I think by bringing the concept of the matrix back, but really just keeping it in that same world, they don't get the opportunity to really say something new. Like you mentioned at the beginning of the podcast about, uh, you know, social media and, and echo chambers and this and that, right? Like how technology can impact all of these different things. Instead, we're kind of just, again, we're just kind of playing in the, with the same characters in the same spot. Mm. You know, even they're like, oh, what happened to Zion? IO, like look at IO. I mean, honestly, does it look any different than Zion? No, not really. <laughs> It's pretty much you know, the same it's like thing. it's just Zion 2.0, I guess. You know, they didn't build like some crazy new city in 60 years that you know is harmonious with machines, and maybe there's a new threat that is you know trying to disrupt that harmony. But why? Instead, yeah. it's just you know a lot of more of the same. Yeah, that's a good point. 
So I don't know. But then you talk about like sequels in a real world sense of like massive amounts of time passing before you do a sequel. And often that can be troublesome because, yeah, like you said, fan bases themselves uh, tend to, you know, lose that fire for the original product the same way they had it, where if you had made this 10 years ago, people might have still been really into the Matrix. Right. And I think a great example of that is the Terminator franchise, right? We already talked about it, but Terminator's done a good job of every five years or so, they come out with a Terminator movie, they might throw out a television series, and it keeps fans reminded about the property and invested. And uh, it's like the Matrix let it sit for too long before they tried to revive this. And I know WB's argument is, oh, there was COVID, oh, but I mean, let's not kid ourselves. Spider-Man just killed it in the box office. Yeah. If people, if the fan base was motivated and it truly existed and they had tapped into it as I think they thought they would, uh, we would have seen, you know, blockbuster numbers. And that's not what we got. And you would think, you know, for a lot of people, the Matrix would warrant, you know, viewing on a big screen. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, at least if they release the Matrix one on the big screen again, I'd probably go. (laughs) <laughs> no, I, I, I would too. And I mean, I should have known this because when I went to see the Matrix in the theater, I think not opening day, I think it was the next day, I was the only person in the theater. Yeah, that's a bummer. Just because, I mean, even myself, I ended up catching the Matrix on HBO Max because I have HBO. And I know, you know, they probably to a certain extent regret, you know, committing their entire 2021 slate to you know, Simultaneous. same day, yeah, same day mm-hmm. launches on both. Um, I mean, I get it on one hand, like they committed to it, it was already troublesome for them on a lot of different levels. So they're like, screw it, we're just going with it and we'll ride it out, however, the chips fall. But yeah, I mean, obviously, Spider Man has now proven that people will go out to the theaters even during a pandemic if they really want to see the movie, yeah, right. You know, I think they said Spider-Man had like the second or third biggest opening weekend of all time. You know, yeah. I think second behind Avengers Endgame. God, yeah. Which wildly, if you look it up, made like a hundred million more dollars more. <laughs> Wild. Like, I don't <laughs> even know how there's enough seats in theaters at that point. Yeah, right. <laughs> no, it's crazy. Like that's, I wonder what percentage of the population saw Endgame on opening weekend like a (laughs) lot like a lot it's probably like four percent or something you're like wow yeah so it's it's pretty crazy um i don't know i I think to me that the biggest takeaway though is like was it fun to kind of see those characters again you know is neo uh keanu reeves most iconic role maybe you know it might be the matrix might be you know the defining Ooh, film okay. of his yeah. Good point. filmography so i mean i had fun like i enjoyed the movie this wasn't you know home sweet home alone where you know i had to <laughs> oh god I hate like suffered through it you know fuck uh, that it, movie as a you know kind of paltry imitation of the original i was like no i mean there's there, it's fun obviously i thought the filmmakers by going kind of meta with the video game and mentioning warner brothers like they were kind of poking fun at the movie's existence themselves and you know, the fight scenes and stuff are still fun. They're not groundbreaking and they're not groundbreaking in the way that we expect certain things from the Matrix franchise. So it was a lot of, uh, you know, kind of rehashing similar fight sequences in new ways. But I enjoyed the movie. I just, you know, if I was ranking it, you know, I'm like, no, it's it's not up there with the original. Well, and, and I mean, and I am, and I do, did wonder about this, right? Only one of the Wachowskis was involved in this film as opposed to both of them, which, you know, I kind of wonder how did that impact the final product, right? So many of their films, they worked as a team and they didn't hear, you know? Yeah. And it's funny too, because obviously they themselves, um, you know, have gone through some transformations, And it's interesting because going back to the original Matrix, you know, we mentioned earlier, you know, identity is actually a big theme within the Matrix. Yeah. And even to that end, you know, when 
looking at something like maybe the trans community and how the matrix could be, you know, interpreted through those lenses. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. Know, I, I, I still don't think it really went there and it no, could have, right. yeah, it you're could right. have, they could it's have a great found, opportunity. Yeah. They could have found, you know, in this climate, in today's climate, I mean, you could have made a story that really kind of spoke to what, what that means. Yeah. That's what that point. feels like. I mean, you really could have, I mean, you know, gone for it and who knows, maybe the original matrix was, you know, the pinnacle that was, you know, what they were doing at the time. And they were exploring that in that film and it was fun to revisit it. But I mean, yeah, I mean, I think in 2021, especially given some of the uh, conversations that were going around, you know, about like Chappelle special and all these different, you know, elements in our culture that we're kind of revisiting. I mean, the matrix could have been a real interesting blockbuster film that could address that without, you know, having to shove it in your face, you know, they could have really made something about all kinds of identity and different things. I don't know. It just seems like a missed opportunity to me. Lots of missed opportunities, man. Um, so, I mean, do we even need to ask the question? You already said your opinion. Um, love the original. I love actually the original and I, I really liked Reloaded a lot. I felt Revolutions was, you know, a bit of a letdown, mostly because I feel like they got away from the three main characters, sure. Neo, Trinity, and Morpheus. They sidelined almost all of them for a majority of that film. And I was like, well, you know, at the end of the day, like when you're telling a story, like we're following these characters and, you know, Morpheus is stuck on a ship somewhere. Trinity gets killed off like halfway through the film and Neo can't see. And he's just like trying to find his way. You have this big battle at Zion, but it's with all these characters that we're like, I just met these guys. True. That's a good point. That's a, that's a good point. I mean, I think the other thing too, is I think as an audience, our expectations are, are kind of stacked against the filmmakers just because the first film was so groundbreaking, right? From a narrative standpoint, from a, you know, what it presented in this whole, this whole concept of the matrix that we had never seen before. And I think we go to every matrix movie expecting a little bit of that, that mind blowing experience, you know, that you don't get a lot. I mean, maybe something like Inception or The Tenant Try to Do It, you kind of get that. But I think we go to Matrix movies expecting to be wowed. Yeah. And they did it the first time. And I mean, I don't know that you could ever do it again in that same universe because, you know, at that point, we've seen behind the curtain. Um, yeah, and you, you actually think, you know, there's two questions in the first Matrix that propel the entire film. Mm -hmm. And those questions at the very beginning, Trinity tells Neo, like, you're here for the same reason that I was here. You want to know what is the matrix, mm -hmm. right? And so right from the very beginning of the film, I mean, there's already this, this massive intrigue. That's the title of the film. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're like, okay, so like, what is the matrix? And they go about answering that. But Neo's role is accompanied by a second question. Is he the one? Mm -hmm. And so it, the second half of the film is really propelled from a character standpoint then in Neo's belief, right? And everyone else's belief in him. And you have to have, I think the matrix, that's what we were talking about with like philosophy and introducing a concept. You want to introduce something early on that's incredibly intriguing. You know, that gets people to think about, you know, some aspect of how our lives are constructed. And I still think the Matrix could do it. <laughs> like, the concept of the Matrix is so open to, I don't know, so many different things. I just, I feel like you could still do a really, really dope story in that world. Well, audience, what do you think? You know, we would definitely love to hear your thoughts about these Matrix movies. Did you see 
this latest film had as its stack up against the original. And what I'm really concerned with is, is there anyone who really hates the matrix? And I will be fully transparent here. Like when I saw the matrix the first time I was like, awesome, trippy movie. Um, I was never someone who I really considered like super in the fandom. Like some of our friends who go, you know, watch the matrix all the time and go see all the movies. Um, (laughs) So is there anyone out there that really hates it? That's what I want to know. I love the matrix. I went to all the midnight show premieres except for resurrections. So that's a lie. I didn't see the original one. I was going to say, I don't think you saw the first one. (laughs) Yeah. Didn't know what you were getting into there. (laughs) Reloaded and revolutions. I did. I went to the midnight premiere of both those and they were awesome. You know, it's funny though, because it speaks volumes to what people's expectations are for the matrix. I think reloaded was the highest grossing rated R action movie when it released Mm -hmm. and because reloaded was not what people were expecting. I think revolutions made less than the original. Wow. That's so it just, they, the second one just didn't really connect with people. I think the way they thought it would. And I don't know. I think the matrix itself, the the films and, and what the world represents is an opportunity for us to be, you know, reflexive and look at, the constructs and things that we have in our lives. And if the story is not doing that, then it's just an action movie or just a sci-fi movie. And that's what separates the original matrix is it was a little bit more. It was a little bit true. No, that's a good point. So, and that's why, yeah, my pick is the original one. And to our listeners, let us know your thoughts. So that actually wraps up our episode. If there's anything else you guys want us to discuss or bring up in, in future episodes, we'll be sure to address it. Because we've said on this show many times, uh, well, CP and D-Man, this is our show. And <laughs> <laughs> if we want to do another episode on The Matrix because someone brought up a really good point, then we'll just revisit it and there'll be a new one. <laughs> Definitely. So be sure to uh, follow the show. You can go to filmmakerscompass.com. And there we have all our links to our social channels, YouTube, everything. You can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts as well as Google Play Podcasts. And leave us a five-star review if you enjoy the show or any review at all. So that way we can make the show better. And we really appreciate you guys listening. CP, take us out. On that note, thanks for hanging out and talking Matrix with us. We hope that you're going to keep watching movies and that you will check in next week.